Welcome to the Cambridge Creatives Q&A with Daniel York Lowe. Hi, I'm Claire, Social Media Officer of Cambridge Creatives. And I'm V, and I'm the Scheduling Officer. Huge thank you for supporting Cambridge Creatives. We are a student-run creative collective and we are curating a series of talks with world-renowned professionals in film, TV and theatre. So please follow our Facebook page to find out more about future events and opportunities. Just a couple of housekeeping rules before we begin. If you have any questions for our guest speaker, please type them in the Q&A function, not the chat, it's down here, and we will read them out for you. And bear with us if there are any technical difficulties and let us know in the chat if there are any problems hearing or seeing us and enjoy the Q&A. So Daniel Yorklow is a renowned actor, director and scriptwriter. He's most known for his work as an actor on stage and screen, working with the Royal Court, RSC and National Theatre, as well as opposite Ewan McGregor in Rogue Trader and Leonardo DiCaprio in The Beach. Recently, Daniel featured in the best-selling essay collection, The Good Immigrant. We are honoured to have this acclaimed creative speak. So for our first question, we would just love to know, when did you know you wanted to be a creative, whether that was acting that led you first or writing? I mean, I think um, I think it was like quite apparent to me from an early age, but not, not, not in terms of being a, an actor or a writer. I, d I didn't know anything about that, but I... I um, I was playing guitar in punk rock groups when I was 14 years old. I mean, I was, um, couldn't, you know, couldn't play properly or anything and sort of learn a bit, you know, but it was always that, that, that was, it was music at first. There was always something like that. I, I couldn't really get my head around the idea of, I, I mean, going to work on a building site every day or anything like that, which, which was what in my background, that's what it would have been, or I don't know, God knows what, to be honest. Um, but then acting, well, I mean, not till I was sort of like 19, 20, did I even consider it really. Mm. And writing, I mean, like I used to write songs when I was younger, but I didn't ever think I could, I don't think I wrote a script. I might try to write one when I was 29 or something. I don't think I, I really wrote one until I was in my forties. Mm. Which is late, I mean, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. Did you find then, so there's always this sense of a creative impulse then kind of running throughout like your childhood and teen years, but then did you ever, was there like a particular moment where you realised, ah, this is a job, people can make a living out of this rather than it being like a, a pastime or a hobby or a way of kind of like nurturing something that you just really enjoyed? I mean, it, it, it was always my aim to, I, I guess, to avoid working <laughs> properly. So yeah, I wanted to be a professional musician. And then, and then when, I, when I discovered the theatre, um, completely by accident. Um, mm. What was you know. that accident out of curiosity? How did you have that encounter? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I I was this is a, I was yeah I was in a in a in a drug and alcohol rehab centre when I was nineteen years old, in in a, in a in a place called Western Super Mare, which is for those of you who don't know, it's a seaside town in Wiltshire. It used to be the top holiday destination for people from Birmingham, but obviously it isn't anymore. <laughs> Because people just go on EasyJet. Well, obviously they can't at the moment. Uh -huh. But but you know, since then, obviously it's one of those kind of towns that's fallen into disrepair and hard times. It does not have the income it has. But what it does have is, if you chuck a stick at Western Soup now on any given day, you're going to hit a recovering alcoholic or drug addict. It's it, it's the rehab center of Southern Britain. It's I'm you know it's unbelievable. And I was there, and I was in a halfway house for men, and there was a girls' halfway house, and there was a, there was quite a well-to-do middle-class girl, lovely girl. And she was she was doing drama at the college and she said, Oh, come watch my play. So I did. And I just like was kind of like, wow, this is amazing. I wonder if they'd let me do that rather than working on the I mean, there was some sort of youth opportunity scheme where they put I mean, you, you know, they used to do these kind of like low wage, um, low wage jobs for unemployed people. And I, you know, it would be me being a gardener. I mean, that was like it was awful. And she was doing drama. I thought maybe they'll let me come on the course and play guitar in the pit band or something and I got on the course basically and the teacher was really good with me and I started acting there but um I, I mean I and that was my aim then was to was to be an actor but I mean I have to say you know for all my avoidance of work for the first 15 odd years I do a lot of horrible jobs to be honest mm. so I didn't <laughs> I didn't escape <laughs> <laughs> Fair. and um did you then go on to train or did you just jump yeah. straight into the industry? Um, Cause I know there's a huge variety of ways of kind of getting work and stuff. So yeah, did you kind of head off into some formal way or were you learning on the job as such after doing that course? 
No, I, I went to uh, I went to drama school at Weiss 15 acting school, um, which I only ever did two drama school auditions. I, I East 15 and, and Rose Rupert, and they both offered me places. And it was complete. Again, I didn't really know what I was doing. The teacher gave me a stack of prospectuses like that and two of them had application forms in them. So I just filled out the two that had application forms. And I got into drama school and I went there for three years. And and I went from being like, I was very provincial, you know, I was I, I grew up in the West Country and, and didn't, I think I've been to, I think my parents took me to London once to watch England play at Wembley. I'd been there for a day and I didn't know anything about it. And there I was in London, a drama school, not really, I didn't have a clue what I was doing. And, and it was it was quite traumatic, I've got to say. Um, but I stuck, I stuck with it. <laughs> got through it yeah would you say that you'd like recommend that as a route to get in into what you do now to any students who are kind of watching or do you think drama school not quite so uh worth it anymore in this day and age i don't even know i mean it's so hard i mean you've got to finance your way through it and stuff like that i don't know the only thing i'll say is about drama school is there's two things i, I i'm not i'm not actually convinced that that you get taught brilliantly all the time there sometimes you do sometimes you don't I don't feel I particularly did um it can be quite a horrible toxic abusive environment but there's two things about it number one you can do all the bad acting you like and it's it's not going to mess your career up you know you you, you, know, you I mean it doesn't feel like at a time it feels like you're under pressure but actually you're not really under pressure number two people People don't take you seriously if you if you say you want to be an actor. No one takes you seriously, and they take you even less seriously if you haven't been to drama school. That's just the sad fact. They don't take you seriously if you've been to drama school. They take you even less seriously if you haven't. They literally just, you know, you're just there to be dismissed when you first start. It's so hard, and even when you've been in it for years, there the, the, there's a steady supply of people just ready ready to dismiss you completely. So it's really hard. So that's that's the only thing I'd say about it. But in this day and age, I don't even know. I, I don't. I mean. I'm not, you know, you've you got to find your way in the way you, the way you want it. And pe people have to follow their own instincts. And there are people who've got into it by all sorts of weird and wonderful ways. Mm -hmm. I mean, for the sake of some of our viewers here, would you be able to kind of like give a sense of what alternatives would there be to like outside of drama school of some of these weird and wonderful ways that you perhaps heard of or encountered? Well, I, I don't know. You're at Cambridge, right? I don't know. They, do they still have footlights there? I mean, a lot of, you know, I mean, I think university drama societies, I mean, they can be really, really good. And, and I mean, and a lot of brilliant performers have come out of those. Um, there is also the thing where you just literally try and get yourself cast in, in, in if you're an actor, that is, just try and get yourself cast in, 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 in fringe shows in London or, or wherever you are, you know? I mean, I know a lot of larger cities have small fringe theatres, you know, you just have to... You, I mean, it's 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 awful. It's a kind of job no one believes you can do unless they see you doing it. And that, that, mm. that, that, that's always the kind of difficult thing about it. But I mean, I would, you know, I would suggest some sort of uh, either drama school environment or university environment is probably preferable because, like I say, you, you know, what I mean, you you've either got you you've got to go out there and rock up at auditions and you know. And say, look, I think I can do this when you maybe not done it before. And and I'll be honest, on the other side of it, you don't know you don't know who you're getting involved with and how good or bad they're going to be. And they're, they're, you know, there's some you know, theatre theatre's a bit. I mean, it's the wild west at the best of times. You get out of fringe theatre, I mean, it's like I do, there's no knowing who you're going to get. And there are some complete charlatans out there, and probably doing you more harm than good. If I'm brutally honest, you know, in all sorts of ways. Mm. Where are you? Yeah. <laughs> Give, so given that about acting and kind of your way in, we were wondering, um, you said you came to writing quite late, but yeah. how did you kind of make that transition into writing or pique that interest in it? I, I, yeah, I, you know, that is like, I don't even, people always said that, people always said, oh, you should write something, and I was determined I, I never would and I never could, I didn't think I was, it, it's very daunting, daunting writing, I think, that it takes, I mean, there was a thing where they were saying, how, how, how is it that so many white middle class males were writers at one point? And, and it's because it's because they're they're in I don't want to offend anyone in the room, but they're, they're, they're they feel entitled enough to do it. You know, there was there was I mean, if you look, this is this is just gender. Look at women. If you look to a certain point in the 20th century, there were very few female playwrights. 
in Britain. Now, why is that? Did all the women in Britain suddenly suddenly become talented? No, it's no, no. It's just like they, they, you know, that there, there has to be an environment where they can believe they can do that. And now I would say, I would suggest that maybe most of the really uh, important playwrights are women. I mean, certainly, certainly in the last 30 years, I mean, I mean, Carol Churchill's just in a league of her own, I think, probably, do you know what I'm saying? And and, and I don't know, in, 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 in the 19th century, would Carol Burnett write plays? I don't know. Um, but I, I guess what it was, was there was a, there was a, there was a, um, there was a thing for, ethnically diverse filmmakers. There was a course that the BBC were running and, and you had to send in a short film script. And um, my wife said, so why don't you try writing this? And, and I, I did, I wrote this film, which, and I didn't get, I didn't get on the course, you know, I didn't. But I, I have made that film. It's a short film about, about, about you know, it's, it's called Mikusho's Dream and the Killing of a Chinese Actor. So it's all about, it's all about, you know, uh, a Chinese actor. Or we think he's a Chinese actor. I don't know. You know, he wants to do Shakespeare, and just goes up for terrible casting. So, so I, I kind of wrote that, and and it was like it was like a fifteen minute short. And from that, I kind of thought, okay, maybe I can write longer things. I got a more. It was screenwriting at first. I, I did a lot of screenwriting. Um, I got I got to the final. I, you know, on these film four things, I got, I got selected and got taken through the X Factor deselection process and got got all the way up to, you know, the finals. And, you know, I was like, like film four, looked at one of my feature film scripts about five minutes and decided it wasn't commercial enough, which it probably wasn't in fairness. And then, and then, <clears throat> and then there was a whole thing about, <clears throat> I'd come from the theater, didn't ever think I could write a play. And I got into a Royal Court uh, group for, for um, East Asian, for people of East Asian extraction. And then, you know, it was it was a Royal Court doing their box ticking exercise, if we're brutally honest. But from that, two of us got selected for the Royal Court Studio Group, which was a proper playwrights group. And there were some amazing writers in there, you know, Asane Gray, Icy Lin, um, really, I mean, I, you know, the whole group was just phenomenally talented. Mm -hmm. And they, I mean, I, you know, everything, every, as a writer, everything I got comes from the Royal Court. They were, you know, they, they, they were just like amazing for me. Mm -hmm. I'd just be really curious to find out of what is it, how much do you find like writers groups and working with others beneficial to your writing process and what that experience is like? Because it can feel like quite a solitary affair. Yeah. Um, and like, do you find like, whether it is through a formal scheme attached to a theater that finding like your community or, or your tribe has been helpful in terms of developing your voice as a writer? Yeah, definitely. I, I think as a, as a playwright, there's no, I've been, I, like I said, I was on two Royal Court groups. I was on, uh, Another one, I was on a, a one at the Orange Tree, which was, it was invite only. And I'm, I've been on one for the last year at the Royal Court, which is invite only. And I have to say, for me, I mean, I've worked in a variety of disciplines. Writers are the most generous with each other, I have to say, in terms of like, you know, and there's a thing about being sat there in a group and you read each other's work and you kind of talk about scripts and you talk about approaches, characters, styles, genres, do you know what I mean? Um, and form, I talk about form a lot. And, and like I say, I've been lucky enough to, to be in groups with, with some truly phenomenal writers. And that, that, raises, that raises you, you know, it, 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 there's no, you know, when you sat there on your own and, and, and you, it's just you, but when, when, when you're suddenly in a group with really talented writers and, and you, you kind of like, you get to share their kind of mindset and their thinking and their approach and you, you, you kind of kick off each other and it, that, that it, it just goes up, up the level just goes up and up and up it, i i would definitely recommend it yeah so what do you kind of how do you find subjects to write about what kind of inspires you um to start writing something it can be i mean i I don't, all sorts of things really. I mean, I, I, I hit on something really, I, I guess, which, 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 which was um, the East and Southeast Asian diaspora and the stories from that, because, you know, it's a huge, geographically, it's a huge region. Um, um, population wise, it's huge. But the, the amount, of, sheer amount of stories there and the sheer amount of, I have to say, very real pain uh, and trauma which I don't, you know, and the amount of, let's be 
brutally and the amount of absolute oppression that goes on in that part of the world you know it, it, it kind of it inspired me to write I mean I, I guess as well and I don't really write for myself to perform actually it's not true I started writing this kind of spoken word poetry thing with dancers and stuff which which I do perform myself but but in, in terms of writing actual drama I, I never you people always say that you should write you should write so you can write parts for yourself because because being being of east and south east southeast asian heritage it was very very hard as an actor I'm not gonna lie it's it's, it's, it's very very and being a mixed race it's very very difficult and people would say to me why don't you write something that you for yourself and I, I was like I don't really want to write parts for myself to be honest I don't like it but I do I do think about writing parts for people like me you know um I just think our, our stories are, are really important they need to be told and the the, the effect that geographic region is going to have on the world in the next few years, or the effect it's had in the last few years, um, is just you know, and and I just feel we're 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 as a as a race as a people, we you know, there's a, there, there's a lot of there's a lot of untapped suffering, and I have to say, and it's not it's not I don't think we have much outlet for it, and I, I wanted to that that was felt, I felt like I found a purpose there really that was, that was the stories I wanted to tell, but different things things I read in books. You know, I, I do a lot of reading these days, a lot of stuff about history and stuff like that. And, you know, it just could be anything that, you know, and there's, there, there's things I've read about. I think I'd like to write a play about that. And I never got around to doing it. Well, you've never had the support to do it or don't think, you know, you could, you know, ideas, you can just sit down and write scripts. You can do that a couple of times, but after a while, you can't just write scripts and, and, and wait for people to put them on. You, you kind of got to have an inkling that somebody's going to put it on before you sit down and write it because it, it, it's very, very, it's hard work. Mm. Do you feel a kind of responsibility to tell those kind of untold stories that you were talking about when you're writing? Yeah, definitely, definitely, I do, and I, and I accept that responsibility. I, I, I sometimes hear people of my diaspora group raging about that. They go, "Well, why do I have to do that? Why can't I just, you know, what?" I mean, I, I the one thing that gets me: why do I need to be pigeonholed? Well. <laughs> You know, if we're talking about East and Southeast Asia, we're talking about a quarter of the world's population, a third of the world's population. It's a lot, man. How are you pigeonholed by that? You know, and you, you want to write about about people living in Berkshire? I don't understand that. You know what I mean? I, I, you know, and, and there is a thing, and it is it is quite scary. I, I, I do understand to extent it's really scary. You, you, you get, I think Asian Americans call it the, the rep sweats. You know the, the you know representation. You know I got, I got the rep sweats, man. You know what I mean. You feel like your community in inverted commas is going to turn on you, and and um, I think you know that's just like there's a lot of fear around it, a lot of very real danger, a lot of very real heat. You know, I heard a, a friend of mine, Ash Kotak, who's a South Asian poet. He talks about his community. He said well, one thing I tell about my community is is when people get angry with you, it's actually very 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 violent. And and I would agree with that. I would agree with that people in Asia there, there's a certain kind of intensity it gets really it gets really hot and it, it is it is dangerous but it's definitely a responsibility and it's a responsibility I I I, I accept it I accept it I'll, I'll take it on do you find because you were saying how you kind of were first writing for screen and then emerging into theatre as well do you find that you've kind of found a different process for both if you even have like a writing process or whether it's different for each project is there any way you can kind of distinguish your approach to doing a project for screen and a project for the stage for instance as a writer? yeah definitely and to be honest there, 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 there's, there's a difference in approach with whoever you're writing for as well like I always say I always go about how brilliant the Royal Court is but the problem with the Royal Court is is you <laughs> they will dramaturg you into writing a certain kind of play that I, I'm sometimes nobody else in the world will put on. <laughs> it's, it's like there, there's a friend of mine. I, I, he sent me a play to do a reading of his. Um, he's a friend now. I didn't know him that well then. And I, and you know, he said he wrote it on on uh, in a royal court group. And I looked at the play and and I, I thought, yeah, it's a brilliant, brilliant play. No one else is going to produce that. <laughs> so there is definitely. I mean, in, in terms of film, I, I don't know. There, 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 there's all these sort of rules people make um i think I, i've always thought cinema and i'm not sure it's not the art form cinema it's the people who who run it and control it in 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 britain certainly um cinema and tv it's there's full of rules there's, there's a lot of rules there, you know you you, you you your protagonist should not be on off screen for more than five minutes and 
you, you know, something has to happen. The, the inciting act has to ha has to happen at the end of the first act. Or I, you know, fifteen minutes. I don't. You know, that that's quite that's quite tricky. That's quite tricky to, to navigate. Whereas in theatre, I think there's less rules, and people want you to experiment with form a lot of the time. But you, I, I, I mean, the simplest way I can put it. When you're writing the screen, you've got to get to the point very, very quickly. So you're always going to shave out, shave out, shave out. You, you want, you, you know, you need to go like a bullet because people have got no tolerance for you. They, have to, you know, you know. I mean, it's not like the theatre. They paid their money. They'll sit there. You've, you've, you've got 10, 15 minutes. Good grace. On screen, right? They can just, they can walk out. They can turn it off. They, you know, you, you've got about three minutes right, max. You've got to grab them. So I think I think I often feel like 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 screenwriting is is about getting to the point as quick as possible. Sometimes theatre writing feels like you've got to kill time, you know, and you have to figure things like how do I get how do I transition from one screen one scene to the next? How do I get people on off the stage? I think Alan Aitborn, Alan Aitborn always said that he said he said he said I know how to get a character from one end of the stage to the other with a cup of tea. He talked about that that kind of stagecraft. Where, where, whereas with, with with screen, you know. There are obviously budgetary concerns, you know. So, so like, like if you if you write like what I did in in one of my short films, I wrote I wrote the 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 the, the Japanese army bombing Singapore in the background as the ship was pulling out, you know. And 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 the producer who had my wife, she sort of looked at me and said, "We, we can't do that, <laughs> you, know, gonna, you know." So, so there are obviously you can't just, but, but th theoretically, technically, you can literally go from Cairo to to Basildon. You can do that, yeah. right, in the blink of an eye. In, in, in the space of like two lines. Whereas in the theater though, it is getting to the stage where you can do that more. You do, you generally have to think about, uh, you know, about, about how you're gonna manage that and how, and how you're gonna pace the story. A lot, a lot, a lot of pacing in, on screen as well as down to editing, you know what I mean? Where, where, whereas in the theater, you've got to think about that a lot more. Who would you say, um, in terms of your own writing, could you give any recommendations for screenwriters that really excite you um, in terms of recommending if you've got scripts to read? And similarly, you were mentioning about works of like Carol Churchill as well, of any playwrights that you think are really worth reading as well, of stuff that's perhaps been a really heavy influence on you and your work. God, so many. Um, did you want to watch screen or theatre? Um, either whatever you would prefer just if there are any names that come to mind I realize that might be quite tricky to pick out a select number if okay I can't remember the guy's name hold on two seconds <laughs> okay Harlan Ellison mm -hmm. wrote a screenplay for iRobot now people think of iRobot as a film that Will Smith did it's a book by Isaac Asimov Harlan Ellison wrote a screenplay adaptation of that, that book, which never got made. You can buy it. It is it's phenomenal. It's absolutely phenomenal. Isaac Asimov said it was the only proper science fiction film script he'd ever read. Um, it it never got made because he went to see the he went to see the head of the studio or something. The head of the studio started giving him notes, and this is how Harlan Ellison tells it. He says, "I realised from his notes he'd never read my script." So I said to him, you're about as much use as an aubergine. So the film never got me, but it is a phenomenal script. I mean, I, I go, yeah, yeah, it's a phenomenal script. I mean, in terms of, I don't know, filmmakers uh, who write scripts, I, I mean, God, man, Fassbinder, uh, Werner, Reiner, Reiner Werner Fassbender is a German. I mean, I think he dropped dead when he was 35. He, 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 he just trucked out films and plays and smoked and drank and took drugs and, you know, and he died very young. But yeah, I, I find him, I mean, in terms of his writing and, and, and the boldness of it, uh, I mean, he did a film in the, in, the, in the 70s in Germany about a middle-aged woman having an affair with a younger black man. I mean that that is I mean that's bold that that time in Germany that's bold you know what I mean he he you know I mean I mean his, his films come and go but his writing is so wild it's just so wild and kind of like you know you just feel he's not following any rules he's doing like what I was saying with you a minute ago at cinema there seems to be a lot of rules you you feel like he's just not following them at all um 
in terms of theatre writing, which I think is where 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 the writer is kind of in charge. I mean, there, there, there's a whole lot. I mean, I go back to those those those, those, those Greek playwrights, um, Sophocles and um, Aeschylus. But you know, you go up forward um, around Shakespeare's era. Christopher Marlowe. I was in a Christopher Marlowe play a couple of years at the RSC. I, he, he was. I'd never really engaged with him before, but I think he's. You know, his writing was every bit as good as Shakespeare's. There's also, um, there's uh, two Chinese playwrights, uh, Guan Hanqing and uh, Tan Xianzu, who, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, really, I mean, that they, they, they wrote, I mean, Guan Hanqing wrote plays for, for kind of public marketplaces and stuff, you know, and he, he wrote, I mean, he just wrote for the people and, and, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's not, it's not a drama style we have here in Britain. It's just not, you know what I mean? Uh, Tan Shin Zhu was an um, amazing play called The Piano Pavilion. Uh, Shakespeare's contemporary and scholars say every bit is good. I mean, I kind of agree. It's, but I mean, again, near enough on stage one, it's formed here because because it's something like, you know, if you did it uncut, it'd be like eight hours long or something ridiculous like that. But there's so many. I like Brecht a lot. I like I like um, Sam Shepard. I always liked as well. Um, there's so many, so many phenomenal kind of writers, and you know the the the, the people you see at the Royal Court. Carol Churchill's phenomenal. Um, yeah, there's, I mean, you know, I could go on and on to be honest. Um, I'm gonna go look all of those up. Um, yeah. do you do you find that, or how do you find that your acting and directing and other pursuits informs the way in which you write? I mean, it totally does. I, you know, I, I think, I mean, I, I, I started off, I started off very much, I mean, I mean, I always think actors, right? People who say you're an actor, you can write. This is true to an extent. As an actor, you can always write characters and dialogue. You, you, we can all, actors can always write dialogue. Actually, there's another, another huge influence was a filmmaker called John Cassavetes, who, um, who, who, you know, he was famous for making that. They called it kind of improvised, an improvised, improvisational style. But I, I read a lot of interviews with him and listen, and he said, no, no, nobody in my films improvises. The script is always written. I let, what I let them do is improvise around the script, but the script is written. But um, he. He's made so many great films. Um, Woman on Woman on the Verge of a, of a, of a Nervous Breakdown. Woman on the Verge with his with his wife Jenna Rowlands is a phenomenal film. And there's a film called Husbands. And someone someone it is very long. And someone said, um, yeah, it's 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 full of um, actorly riffing. You know, what I mean, it's, it's it's actors sort of long long dialogue scenes. You know, and the kind of stuff actors write. So that was kind of what I was like. I used to write you know, from an actor's perspective and, and write a lot of dialogue. And it took me a long time to learn. So you've got to move the plot along. You know, you, you've, got, you've got to get going, you know, because um, it just, you, you haven't got time, you know what I mean, basically. So that's, that was the craft I had learned. So yeah, everything, everything informs, everything informs everything. I think, I think as a director, I'm probably quite good with actors because I think I know what makes them tick, but it's you know, and if 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 I feel grateful for anything, is that, is that I've engaged in all those kind of different practices, and 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 they do. What what really kind of helped me as an actor actually was was there was a woman called Gemma Lloyd who used to run these um, this company called Act Up, and she used to do these acting courses for um, people of all ages who were thinking about going to drama school. So I used to go and teach, but and I, I, actually teaching acting really helped me as an actor because sometimes you just sit there watching and you think, no, just leave yourself alone, you know. Of course, it sounds easy when you can see it happening in front of you. You really go, okay, just don't do anything. You know what I mean? Mm. It really helps. Mm. Amazing. I know that you've worked on a kind of huge variety of projects of differing scales across uh, stage, screen, and radio. But mm. I've always found there's like a real difference between like the projects you're known for, but also the projects you've perhaps really valued as an actor because of how they've stretched you, or the times you've had, kind of, or the experience you had working on them and the process. Yeah. So I would just be really curious to know which roles over your career thus far do you think stretched you the most as a performer or had the most impact on you as a person? To, to be honest, the one that stretched me the most was one of the first things I ever did. And, and to be honest, it, it spoiled me um, in, in many ways in that sense, because I don't think, um, 
unless you're Simon Russell Beal, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't know. People just try and cast you with a type, and I've never fit in a type, to be honest. There were things I've had to learn to do, like, 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 like speak, speak Mandarin or Cantonese. So it's been a challenge. I've had to learn to do it. But I, I suggest that the, the, the probably the, the thing that stretched me the most was I think the second thing I ever did out of drama school was a play called Porcelain mm -hmm. by Che Yu which uh, it started at the Etc. Theatre in Camden Town and it was a huge hit there and it transferred to, to the Royal Court and it did really, you know, people queuing around the block, it was a massive poster of me outside the theatre, it was, it was glorious, I would say, you know, um, but, but the, the play was about um, a 19-year-old Chinese boy who, who murders his gay Chinese man, who murders his boyfriend. In a, in a Bethel Green toilet, and it, it's like really, it was really hard hitting, gritty stuff. And the fact, I was, and there were two things that were absolutely terrifying. Uh, I was playing two things I never thought I really was authentically. Number one, Chinese <laughs> didn't, you know, had a lot of issues around am I authentic enough? Am I really, you know, I grew up in Bath, you know what I mean? Number two, gay, you know, to an audience of gay Chinese people. Yeah, uh, so that was a huge stretch, um, and it, I mean it did well. And I used to get, I used to get, <laughs> I used to get girls wanting to be wanted to, me to be their gay best friend, and then and then reacting with horror when they realised I wasn't gay. You know, I mean, it was like you know, it was it was it was. I would say it was the biggest stretch. It literally was. It, it was it was you know. But there's there's different things that stretch you in different ways. I mean, I mean, you know, when you like the RSC doing 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 classical text, it's a huge stretch. Uh, I did a Moliere play once, which, you know, you're under pressure to be funny. And, you know, some of that stuff doesn't feel funny. And that's the genius of Moliere. It doesn't feel funny in the rehearsal room. You get it on the stage, it's electrifying. Um, Brecht, there's a whole kind of political kind of commentary on his plays, which you don't quite, you know what I mean? You don't quite get. I mean, there was a two-hander I did uh, called Sun is Shining, which, which, which played the King's Head. Batsy Art Center and went off Broadway, New York. It was just me and this girl. And, and the opening 15 minutes of the most terrifying thing, it was literally just monologue, 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 fast, 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 fast talking, fast patter. Really, God, man, you know, I, I used to be literally weeping with fear every night before going on and do that. I, you know, so I got about three weeks in, it's like, yeah, I've got this, do you know what I mean? But I've got, you know, it was, it was quite, quite, quite hairy. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think. You know, I kind of wanted to ask about the fact that you're quite well known for being quite vocal um, about, you know, this kind of pigeonholing um, in the mainstream industry of East Asian actors um, and yourself. Um, just wanted to ask about whether, you know, you think the situation has improved, um, where there's work to be done and what uh, can and should be done. I mean, it's definitely improving, and it always will improve because because you, you you know generations come on, and you've got two things now. You've got you've got third, fourth generation uh, East Southeast Asian people here who've grown up in Britain. You know, they don't they're not intimidated to the same degree. Mm. Um, when I was starting out, and the, the generation above me, they 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 very much saw themselves as foreigners. They very much saw themselves as niche, and they were very intimidated by by white people. They wanted to kind of please white people. But also what you've got as well is, is you've got a generation of white people now, I say under the age of 30, and that they, you know, they, they're generally much more um, open-minded and much more, don't regard you as a foreigner, don't. You, you know, I work with, uh, I work with a, with a young um, director at the Fimbra a few years ago, the play called Pyongyang, a young, young director called Chelsea Walker. She was young then. She's still young, don't know anything. She's still young, but she was like, I think she was 24 then. I mean, I mean, and she was, I don't know, she was a huge talent and a brilliant director for me. You know, I heard a brilliant, you know, like, and just an amazing brain for, you know, for a 24 year old person, but, but, but also completely kind of like not mired in, in white middle class superiority, even though she was from a, you know, Chelsea Walker, she was from a quite comfortable background, you know, what I mean, she was well educated she, she had all all the trappings that would make her you know that might lead her to believe you know what i mean but 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 you know she just wasn't like that and i think that that's generally that's the generation and that's that's the kind of hope hope we all have for the future of this country frankly because i think i think the the older ones have 
stitch this up a little bit, I'll be honest with you. But, you know, so that 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 is definitely improved. But yeah, there's a lot. I mean, when you say about the pigeonholing, um, it's not so much. I mean, everyone's pigeonholed to an extent, but the pigeonhole for East and Southeast Asian actors is a terrible pigeonhole. It's not good. It's 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 foreign. It's othered. It's it's all about um, being kind of periphery, periphery exotica. Um, it, it doesn't respect our diversity. It's all about being authentically, and I use that in, 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 in inverted commas because I don't think it is very authentic a lot of the time, authentically Chinese, authentically Japanese, but, but nothing, nothing about the diaspora of that, nothing about being mixed race or anything. And, you know, the Chinese on their own, it's a huge, huge, I mean, diverse ethnic groups, you know, ridiculously big. Um, and it, it just isn't about, I don't think it's about acting, it's only about, about interpreting characters. It's literally about being a foreign body. You, you, you're there to be a, a racial signifier. And that, that, that will never do. But yeah, it did definitely. In the theatre, it made a huge jump in 2012 um, when we protested the Royal Shakespeare Company's um, passing of the orphanage out. And everything changed for us. But, but prior to that, it was it was difficult to even get on the stage and and for all my complaining i had to, you know even at that point and i hadn't been on stage for a few years there it was like i had to you know i had some sort of body of work um, and i was like ridiculously lucky to have that because it was so hard in those days mm. it's got better in the theater now um tv is still a huge challenge i have to say you know but but tv is a really kind of challenging industry it, it's like if you want to make a film that you you, you know that, that that there is there is a there is a world where you can do it on a camera phone and if the script's good enough, you can post production it afterwards and it, you can technically do it. If you want to do a play, you can, you can, you can hire a room, you can put it on. It probably won't, you know, probably four people and our relatives will turn up and watch it, but you never know, it could go somewhere. Getting on TV, there's, there, 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 there's like layers and layers and layers of gatekeepers. It's so hard, it's so hard. So off the back of that, do you have any words of advice for emerging East Asian talent about how to sort of navigate their way through this industry? You know, um, I'm going to say this, don't be, don't be afraid to say no, because we, we have this idea in our heads that, 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 that if we say no, that's it. And, and I, did, I did work with one very posh actor years ago at the RSC, and he gave some advice to myself and a younger guy. He said, um, he said look, we were both like playing small parts and we didn't like it and he said yeah, look, look, look. And, and and understudying which is no shame at the rsc i have to say it's no shame anywhere really but 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 at the, at the rsc three quarters of the company is understudying everyone covers each other it's part of the kind of company ethos and even even people playing big parts sometimes get asked and some, sometimes the only reason they're not understudying is because they're playing big parts and they simply can't you know what i mean but 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 you, you know doing doing more understudying than what you're doing on the stage he said to this young actor he said look look you know it now so next time they come and they ask you to do this that and that because he thought he was doing too much he said just say no just say no he said they'll remember you i mean i don't know how true that is but but i i i i, I do think there's there's a certain kind of I'm, i mean i realize i'm saying a dangerous thing here because it might not work but I, I i do think there's a certain kind of thing and knowing your mind and knowing what you will and won't do and if, if you're not comfortable doing it I have to say especially especially young women young East Asian women get asked to do some quite demeaning stuff I think some really kind of dreadful kind of fetishized it's you know it's quite it's a really dodgy area and I think I think we have to we have to learn not to be afraid to say no really pertinent stuff um one work that really struck me as something i really uh, admired before i even got to know you and kind of what you do was uh, forgotten which was on at the arcola which is where i first encountered it but also performed at the drum in theater royal plymouth um yeah. and uh for people who aren't aware about what it's about it kind of dramatizes the story and looks at chinese labor corps in uh, the first world war and i was just wondering if you could share with us where the idea to kind of dramatize these stories came from yeah it's a really good question because I, th I think that's where i became i felt i felt a proper writer because what it was was uh i was there's a guy called ricky beadle blair um he, he's 
he's a very brilliantly proudly gay black man who, who and Ricky's thing is getting everyone to write. He'll say, you've got to play, you've got to play. I want to read your play. I want to read your play. You you know, he, he's an amazing man. He, and he, uh, charisma, like, 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 I mean, the closest thing I've seen, I, he's, he's like Freddie Mercury or someone. You know, I've watched him just light up a room. I've watched him introduce plays and he's got middle-aged white women up dancing in reggae. He's just extraordinary, you know. And and he, he was doing this five minute play festival at, at the Bush and he asked me to submit something for it. and and. I wrote this play based on uh, based on something that happened to me about, about about having an argument in a library, and he went, "Yeah, no, no, no." I mean, I know, write write something that you feels important to you, and 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 I, I, I and open on my screen on my computer screen was was an article in the Guardian about the Chinese Labour Corps in World War One and how it was, you know, a, a, a completely kind of forgotten and buried bit of history. And I thought, okay, I can write five minutes about that. So I wrote five minutes not really knowing what I was doing. And even then, even then I had to change a bit because I, I so didn't know. I, I, I put in a line about German tanks and then found out the Germans didn't really have tanks in World War I, which is one of the reasons that they lost, you know, you know, of a lot of other reasons, sheer fatigue, probably a lot of it. But so that that went, you know, in that play first, so it seemed to be quite well. And Ricky said to me, you got to write the whole play now. And I was like, that is like, God, man, that was, that was like, that felt like I would have to do some proper work you know i'd have to go and properly research this and and write something that was right out of my world you know what i mean it, 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 everything everything i'd written up till then had been loosely based on me and my kind of you know this was like thinking back to 100 years ago thinking about having to learn about world war one having to learn about chinese history and politics at the time having to learn about what what was i mean i i did a i mean a ridiculous amount of research um i mean i can I can actually, you know, sit on on panels with professors and stuff now and talk about that stuff. Like, you know, that that's like probably my proudest achievement ever. So, I know over the course of four years, I just I just worked, re researched, and 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 wrote this play. Um, it changed my life. There's no doubt about it. It changed my life. Maybe a writer. It kind of connected me with so much of history and yeah i mean you know it's 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 if i do nothing else i've done that that's how i feel like yeah amazing and i kind of over such a long process as well yeah. do you obviously like i think it would have changed a huge amount from that kind of amplification of that five minute play to then kind of like the research developing it they always talk about playwriting in particular being like a collaborative thing of how when you then eventually got into the rehearsal room how much of an evolution happened with the work them and kind of like was there any massive shifts or changes as soon as you had those words kind of spoken aloud with your company um yeah, yeah. how did it evolve and what was that like it, it never stops evolving to be honest i mean when, when i first wrote it it was four four odd hours long probably with oh, wow. about 35 characters and it came down it was it was just under two hours with with, with six actors um <laughs> and the director i worked on it with kim I mean, she sort of keeps saying, oh, I want to do the four hour version. I want to do the original version. You know what I mean? It was, yeah, it, it just never stopped. Um, I mean, I, I felt like going into rehearsals with it after we'd done, we'd done a couple of workshops on it. And I felt like the basic shape of it was there. The basic shape of it was there. There was, there, was, there was one scene towards the end, which I wrote and rewrote and rewrote again and again and again. I, I can't hear it hundreds of times, literally, before finding the format to take, you know what I mean? But but yeah, it was it was it was always evolving, uh, you know. And I used a certain kind of stylized language approach as well, in it, which was uh, based on you know the idea of literal Chinese literal Chinese translation, with you know an awful lot of kind of swear words and salty aphorisms. Some of which I researched, some of which I just made up. You know, I'll be honest with you. You know, what I mean, I mean, it was it was like it was. Like, I wanted to create, and also we 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 put a lot of. Uh, made I made the central characters amateur Chinese theatre performers, so there was there was a whole lot, and I didn't want to try and reproduce what you see when you go to South as Wells and you see you see Beijing Opera. I didn't want to try and produce that, but there was a sense of knowing about Chinese theatre. And there was a whole load of things I found out. Like they, 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 they have these exits and entrance, and they're known as the Gate of Ghosts. And and the idea, the idea of of the Chinese theatre was 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 it, it was it was a world. The Chinese stage was a world where 
the, the ghosts of the past are kept alive in a way. So it became, and that was my way into the idea of, because the play was called Forgotten, they were forgotten, you know what I mean? And, 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 and our stage is kind of trying try to bring them back to life in a, in a way. And, and that felt a very kind of profound and moving thing. And, and that, was, that, was, that kind of informed everything, but that came fairly late in the day, those discoveries about joining theater. So that, cha that, that, that changed, that lifted the whole thing up a gear, yeah. We just wanted to ask a little bit about um, kind of slightly different project for you, um, the essay in The Good Immigrant. Yeah. Um, wondering just kind of how you became involved in the project and what your aim was when you were writing your part. Um, it was my, my friend, uh, Elaine Wong, who's a, who's a producer and she, she works at the Sheffield Documentary Festival and stuff like that. She, you know, um, she, she, um, she knew Nikesh, who, who put the book together, and, and she said, you haven't got any East Asian writers. And he went, no, I haven't. And she went, you, you, should, um, you should check out Daniel. So I got her to thank for it. I mean, I, you know, I gave her thanks in the book. And, and I, I, Nikesh said, can you send me something? So I sent him the, the first play I wrote, first full length play, was, it was a satirical comedy called The Fu Manchu Complex. And Nikesh said, I really want you in the book. I was like, oh, great, yeah. And it was, it was, you know, it wasn't a lot of money. It was all crowdfunded. It wasn't a lot of money, but I just, you know, I was like, wow, you want me to be in a book? And, and then, and then I, I think, right, I don't know, right, you, you, you want, he wants me to write an essay. And I didn't really know what I was going to write. And then I thought, I thought back and I remember my, my childhood watching, watching this, watching the wrestling on the TV and, you know, the wrestler Kendo Nagasaki which, yeah, was, uh, so I wrote it all for my memory. And then it was really weird. Afterwards, I thought I'm gonna check some of these details. So I, I, I looked on YouTube and I looked at, and I had all the details, right? Everything, everything, everything in it was wrong. So I put a little disclaimer at the end of the essay saying look, that, that historically, this is not very accurate, but it's written, it's my memories. It's how I remembered it. And that, that's how it affected me. So it's a, it's a personal story. It's not, it's not, that, so that's why, but, but yeah, it was, it was, yeah. Perfect. Um, so we know that coming up in the future that you are going to be contributing to the Royal Courts Living newspaper project. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about it as well as how you got involved. It, it, it's on at this minute. They're performing it as we speak now. I mean, yeah. <laughs> this is the thing I've never got used to as a writer. You're sat at home and people are doing your stuff. I've never got used to that. I was so used to, you know, being in the theater on the stage, you know, that, yeah. Um, it was, it was, uh, it was an idea that Vicky Featherstone uh, came up with, who's the artist director of the Royal Court, as you probably all know, but it's based on the US Federal Theater, which was a theater company in the 1930s, uh, coming out of the Great Depression. And it was a way of keeping artists and actors employed in really difficult times that they did this thing called the Living Newspaper, which was very political um very um yeah and it actually got shut down i think because it was too political it's considered marxist or something so oh, wow. he had this idea that that she was wanting to basically you know engage you know all the writers that work at the royal court um and i ended up in edition one just simply because i wasn't available for any of the other auditions so so i feel quite privileged um but yeah, there's, there's, there's like, I don't know, I think there's 12, 13 writers in it. I mean, it's just, so we've all written like a, a piece each basically. And, uh, and and it takes place in various rooms around the building. Um, I was I was saying to V earlier, uh, it's it's actually the online version is now on sale and the online version you can watch from Sunday onwards. I think the online version might might actually be quite extraordinary because they're going to film it with, with, with a proper crew and everything. And, and, it, it would take you around the building and you see different, and there's there's just some, some superb writers in there, Catherine Soper, Chris Thorpe, uh, Jasmine Lee Jones, uh, Somalia Seaton, um, Miriam Batai, you know, I, I mean, I mean, I um, uh, Matilda, Matilda Rubini, it's, uh -huh. it's, I mean, God, man, it, and, and I have to say, I watched a dress rehearsal last night, it just blew me away, I was like, wow, I can't believe we made this, it's just so, Amazing. and it feels really, and it feels really angry and political and but but tender and hopeful at the same time you know what i mean it's really it's a sense of like we're bringing the audience back into the royal court theater and 
you know, and, and writing about our times, writing about what's going on, which is what the Royal Court should be doing. You know, it's not about, you know, pulling up something that, you know, you, you know and, and no offence to, to, to A Doll's House by Henry Gibson, but not pulling up things that were going on in, 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 in country houses in the late 19th century. This is about here and about now, do you know what I mean? About, about the fact that we're in the middle of this pandemic and, <laughs> and recession and God knows, you know, and, and, and racism and whatever, you know what I mean? We're all in the middle of that. And, and it's, it's like we're in the eye of the storm. And that's what it feels like. It feels like, it feels like uh, theater of hard times. It feels really good. We were wondering what kind of uh, section of the newspaper you have written for. Um, we're hearing about it varying from current affairs to agony aunts and all sorts. So I wrote, okay, the, 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 the whole thing was we were, were all supposed to contribute to this front page. The front page is the first thing you see when you go in. And then we were all given like rooms to write in. And I, I got shifted around <laughs> because I couldn't really see the room and, and, and what I wrote didn't really work for it. So they put me in this thing called the shop window, which was actually the box office space. And I wrote this thing about, about um, uh, a friend of mine who, who didn't want to run a Chinese takeaway, but did run a Chinese takeaway, wanted to be an actor, wanted to be a writer, but had kids, had to feed them, you know. And, and uh, it's all about him getting steadily subsumed by fake news and conspiracy theories like he'd send me these videos uh, on, in, on Facebook Messenger and say watch this and it'd be someone like Jordan Peterson and I'd be like why are you why are you what I mean and it, it just you know and it's you know what's going on in the world you know at the moment the, the whole QAnon thing you know and I, I I sometimes write like that when I'm writing kind of like um the, the, these kind of poetic monologues, I, I I try and think of it as like it's almost like a cinema screen because you can have a, you can have one person on stage and they're telling a story. So you can go from right, I run this Chinese takeaway in the northwest, and then you can jump and say, what 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 really what really kicked us off arguing was Hong Kong because he was very pro-China and I was obviously pro-protest and. And then from Hong Kong, we go into, you know, and, and I talk about like my background, about, about my father being from Singapore. And in Singapore, they're just about to lock up a friend of mine for, for holding a smiley face up in protest. And you, you, you can just dart around, dart around like that. It's, it's kind of like, you know, I mean, it's a riff and, and, you, you, and, and then you, you, you go outwards and, and we finish on this, um, we finish on, on anti-vaxxer protesters in Trafalgar Square while, while there's a man in a hospital bed screaming at a Filipino nurse that it's not real and she's part of the conspiracy. The Filipino nurse who's trying to keep him alive, trying to keep herself alive because she's here without papers and she has to work really hard and, and they're right in the front line and, and Filipino, Filipino health, healthcare workers at one point was one fifth of NHS deaths in the first wave, which is extraordinary and it's devastating. So, so basically I, I was able to take in a lot of, lot of issues in five or six minutes, just on that that one character monologue. Yeah. I think what you were saying was very pertinent about kind of the living newspaper reflecting um, what's going on in our times, rather than necessarily having a form of escapism that doesn't feel rooted in our kind of current historical and cultural moment. And um, I now kind of wanted to turn to the future and kind of ask you, with everything that's going on with. COVID, the recession, our current circumstances, uh, kind of any predictions you can make for what the future of our industry or even our creative progress or community is going to be, whether that's in like professional theatre, TV or film, or even just your responses to what you think is going to be next for how kind of we as creatives move on kind of hopefully post COVID. Yeah. Um, I, I, I mean, I don't know. I, I would hope, I would hope we would get back to some sort of the idea of theatre being a civic communal art form, I would, I would, I would hope that would happen. I would hope TV and film would start doing that, start telling stories again, rather than rather than being about spectacle and you know and celebrity. And I would, I would hope you know it would be something that would bring us back together like that. And I, we might, I, I think we might have to rebuild theatre, a lot of theatre from from scratch in a way. And there might be a lot of performances in found spaces and so i've written a few things i've written something which which i think could be literally performed in a disused car park you know i mean that's that's kind of where, where my head's at, at the moment mm. so so i would hope we come out of that and and um we're going to need we're going to need um we're going to need our culture to be really strong because 
it's you know it's just quite it's just quite dark and quite scary we don't know what's going to happen i mean you know the, the the whole world's changed like none of us knew that this time last year none of us knew this was going to happen and then you know when december the 31st brexit i mean i don't know man it's it's, it's mad and i um I feel, I mean, I, I, don't know, I don't want to sound patronizing. I feel especially for your generation, man. It's, 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 it's really, it's raw. I don't, you, you know, I, I, when I was young, I felt like, like we got it really hard, you know, but God, man, that is like, I, I just don't, I mean, I've honestly, I've never known it this turbulent ever in my life. I mean, you know, the last five years has been ridiculous. I've never known anything like it, but you, you have to go there, 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 there. There's been like, you know, when you read about World War Two, World War One, and what it was like then. I mean, you know, I mean, you know, and it, we're not we're not in a war, but it's kind of there's a similar similar vibe to it. I think, yeah. Mm. Mm. Um, and like you said, everything's so uncertain. Um, yeah. But do you have any projects in the pipeline that you can tell us about or tease slightly? <laughs> Um, uh, y y yeah, well, as I say, the living newspapers up online. Um, um, I, I'm going back to my old drama school, he's 15, to create a play with the students there. And, and, and uh, I, there, there, there's something, there's something happening next year. Uh, I'm not really supposed to talk about it at the moment, but, but, but yeah, it, 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 that, that, that is, um, it's going to be one of those kind of like, poetry things with music and dancers but I don't quite know yet but but yeah yeah that, 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 I have to say I've been I've been really really very lucky in, in lockdown I've been I've been like off my feet busy and I don't know it's not like been like that for everyone so I'm kind of in the opposition I I, I started off I started off in this industry feeling like ridiculously unprivileged you know uneducated useless and now I, I feel I feel a bit I feel a bit guilty of my kind of relative privilege at the moment, I have to say. At this point, we're hoping to have some questions from the audience. So any audience members do feel free to chat your, type your questions into the Q&A box and we will read them out. And whilst that is happening, um, I'll just ask our final question, which is quite wholesome. Uh, any TV or film recommendations to fill our covid -y Christmases? Um, anything that you've really enjoyed watching recently over the last couple of months or anything that you're looking forward to watching? I think I've watched over the last couple of months. Uh, if you, okay, this is not the last couple of months, this is like a year ago or something. If you can get hold of it, there's a film called, there's a Chinese film called An Elephant, An Elephant Sitting Still. Um, I, I'm going to look this up. I, it, it's, it's about four and a half hours long. Um, the guy who made it was 28 years old and he committed suicide during the edit. Very tragic. But you see, one of the things, because he was arguing with the, uh, with the producers about the edit, and oddly, because they, they thought it was too long, um, but because he committed suicide, they couldn't edit it. All the rights went to his mum and his mum went, no, you can't do it. An elephant sitting still, it's called. It's about four and a half hours long. Oh, it's one of the best films I've ever seen. It's just, I mean, I, 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 we went to the cinema and, and the ICA in London is only on for a week. And uh, I, I, I said to the guy, there's an interval, right? He went, no. I was like, I'm not going to make this. I'm not going to. I say, I sat there, I, I couldn't move. It was just so brilliant. It's just such a, it's, it's you know, it's set in provincial China. <laughs> Not the kind of thing, like I say, not the kind of Chinese people you see very often in Chinese cinema, let alone on British TV. You know, real people. You know, it's like, yeah, I would, I, would, you know, that, 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 that. I, I, I just thought I'd suggest something that maybe people hadn't heard of, maybe wouldn't know about. I, I you know, I, I like if you, people ask me for recommendation, it's no good saying, oh yeah, go, go and watch, go and watch The Star Is Born. You know, what I mean, whatever, you know, I mean, everyone's seen that. No, you know, but, but I, I thought I'd, yeah, recommend something people maybe haven't seen. Um, we've got a question from the audience. Um, would you ever adapt a text into a stage play or screenplay? If so, what would be your favourite text to adapt? Yeah, I definitely would. I definitely would. Um, there's one I have worked on recently, actually. Which I'm not really supposed to talk about it, but yeah, it was, it was, a, it was, a, it was a Chinese play that I adapted. In terms of I, you know, I think about the, I read, I read, whenever I read novels, I kind of think about, I 
think about how I, I, I might adapt it on the stage. Um, the, the one I'd like to do, I mean, it's really unwieldy, so I don't know how I'd do it, but it'd be, it'd be fun trying, is, is Romance of the Three Kingdoms. It's known in English. I think it's just called Three Kingdoms, actually, which is uh, one of the, 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 there's four great Chinese works of literature, um, Outlaws on the Marsh, uh, Journey to the West, uh, Dream of Red Chambers, and Three Kingdoms. Three Kingdoms is all about about the warring the 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 the, the three kingdoms in when, when when the Han Dynasty dissolved, and it's all about the fight to reunify the the, the dynasty. Um, it's epic. It's a huge, huge book. I mean, it's just like I don't know how how you'd even go about doing it. But full of these phenomenal characters, and thrilling, uh, and you know, eventually heartbreaking. Eventually heartbreaking. But, but a real work of art. A real, real kind of work of poetry even just just phenomenal but there's lots of things man i mean i i you know uh, dostoevsky i'd like to try and adapt dostoevsky i mean i i you know i think about things all the time i'd, I'd, I'd do that with definitely would do it perfect and i think that's all we have time for so i just want to say like a huge thank you daniel for your really wonderful and insightful answers and for giving up your time today as well as oh no thank you and a huge thank you to everyone who joined the call and asked some really interesting questions. Um, thank you. Please like our Facebook page for more updates and opportunities. We've just announced our screenwriting competition and applications are open to write a review for our website. Actually, the screenwriting competition closes soon, so get your scripts in soon for that. Um, we are now on a break for the Christmas holidays. We'll be back next term with some amazing speakers and opportunities to get involved. <laughs>